Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast that's doomed to relive its past lives, because this week we watched Once Upon Time. Written by Chris Chibnall. Directed by Azure Salim. I think I pronounced that <laughs> right. If I didn't, I'm really sorry, man. Directed by uh, Azure and Swarm. No, and uh, aired on November 14th, 2021. Well, I just want Azure to know that I have a long history of butchering like every director's name on this podcast in existence. So you're joining a very elite group of people whose <laughs> yeah. names I've butchered over the years. That should be an IMDb list. People whose names trust your doctor, the Doctor Who podcast has mispronounced over the years. Yeah, the top two would be <laughs> John Pertwee and Jeffrey Beavers. Don't forget that guy from The Prisoner. Um, we could, you know, we could rope this into, we could rope Inevitable into this as well. Check out Inevitable, a classic sci-fi podcast. Yeah, names that, that the Decorative Vegetable podcasting group has butchered. Yep, wouldn't even be the weirdest list on IMDb. Far no, from be, it, in fact. It'd be pretty freaking far from the weirdest <laughs> list on IMDb. Yeah, it would be pretty tame compared to the other lists that uh, you know people create on there. Yeah, we're not going to elaborate on that any further than than that. We're just going to dive right into the fact that like we watched this three days ago, and it just we still feel bogged. <laughs> what are we bogged down by by the? Just how much has happened, you know? We ended the episode and Keon was like, dang, I feel like I've just run a marathon. Yeah, so much. This Once Upon Time kind of returns to the Halloween apocalypse style where it's like a lot is going on. And looking back, just kind of trying to piece together what I remember from the episode, the you know, three days ago, which feels like three months ago. Um, it's like, it is actually pretty straightforward. And they do sit you down multiple times in the episode and explain what's happening. But still, it feels very jam-packed. It's, it's, I think it's kind of because it's, War of the Sontarans was a very, like, straightforward episode. And then, like, every scene occurred after the next scene, you know, it was very linear. This episode is... Linear from the doctor's point of view, but from the audience's point of view is like strongly non-linear because we're seeing different eras of every person in the episode's life. So the editing, there's a lot of cutting between stories very much in the vein of, of the Halloween apocalypse. There's a lot of interesting editing in this episode as well, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Um something else um, that differentiates this from War of the Santarans is that like with War of the Santarans um, it was very clear what that episode was right it was it was the Santaran episode of of Flux it was dealing with that aspect of the story um, whereas like structurally Once Upon Time doesn't really reveal what it is until the very end which is that it's basically Vinder's backstory yeah, this was a secret Vinder prequel. Yeah, it, no, and I actually not, think not it was really pretty secret, but well, I think it was pretty masterfully done. You know, maybe maybe the spoilers out there spoil this for people, but I didn't. Um, once again, I have somehow avoided spoilers, even though I went looking for them. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, I this week was a spoil. Thank you very much. Even though, once again, I was trying not to be, somehow, thanks mostly to all the other Doctor Who podcasts I follow on Twitter, thanks boys, I learned that Joe Martin uh, was going to be in this episode as the Fugitive Doctor. Mm -hmm. I actually think it was sort of masterfully done how it unfolds over the course of the episode and you you slowly piece together and realize, like, oh, this is, this is Vidner's backstory. And it's it, also the Doctor's backstory, the secret backstory of the Doctor, in a way. Yeah, I mean, she, she doesn't I mean, fully obviously learn. Less, less so than Vinda, but... Yeah, she doesn't fully learn who she is, and neither do we. She just gets very upset that she doesn't, um, you know, receive more information. 
to be fair, if somebody deleted the first, I don't know, 10, 10 years of my life, I'm trying to think of like what would be a comparable amount of time in my current lifespan to what the doctor lasts. So if someone deleted the first, let's say, 12 years of my life, I'd be pretty, pretty annoyed too. I mean, it's not like most people, overwhelming majority of people, in fact, don't remember like what's your earliest memory? Like what age was your earliest memory that you can distinctly remember? Know, five? Yeah, for me, it's probably like five. Yeah, you just don't remember. There's a lot of memories that. between when I was five and when I was twelve that that would be deleted. Yeah, it's just like if you deleted like the first five years, you wouldn't actually be deleting that much that you can remember. Because I think you don't actually start forming. I, I don't think you form the ability to to form memories until you're like two or three or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, actually, I do, actually, I do have memories of, like, preschool, but they're just, like, flashes, you know, of being, like, three or four. They're just, like, just random images. They've been deleted to make room for all the garbage we learn on this podcast. <laughs> for Doctor Who information. <laughs> <laughs> You're a walking, talking TARDIS wiki, Keon. How does it feel? <clears throat> I'm actually not. <laughs> I'm actually not. <laughs> You, you say that until the moment when, like, like last week, when just in the middle of the episode, you go, this is kind of like, you know, that episode, I don't know, State of Decay. <laughs> and then it's like, damn, why do I know that? Yeah, I know something happens in, like, in <clears throat> real life, and you're like, hey, wait a minute, this is just like, you know, insert Doctor Who episode here. <laughs> be kind of weird if something happened in real life, and you're like, wow, this is just like State of the State of Decay. That, like, one Doctor Who episode that featured vampires, like, real-life vampires. Was that, well, was that the, the one Doctor that, Who that um, Romana left in? No, that was Warrior's Gate. No, that was, War- yeah, it was Warrior's Gate. See, even knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true enough, I guess. At least would be great at Doctor Who trivia, I guess. Which which just makes us well suited to picking up all the random classic Who references they clearly make in these episodes. Anyway, the the, the episode actually opens by you know taking the extremely extremely ballsy option of introducing yet another plot thread. Yeah, not even the first one, not even the only one that this episode introduces. So, you know, halfway in, we're, we're getting more and more and more. I'm going to be, frankly, even if the explanation is the worst damn explanation in the history of explanations, I'm going to be quite impressed if Chris Chibnall manages to tie this all up in a bow at the end of the season. Well, well this, this uh, story is pretty well tied you know it's it's sort of tightly knotted by the end well there's there's still more for to to come i'm sure between bell and uh vendor but still we we kind of get what's happening we we get the backstory of what bell's doing but she's still yet another loose cannon in this story you know she's her story is not done because we know she's still gonna appear again <clears throat> right well, anyway, um, it starts off with her. We don't know who she is at this point in the episode. She's. Uh, we do know that she's looking for someone. The beginning of the episode seems to indicate that she's on Earth, just via the landscapes and all that stuff, but apparently that's not the case. Yeah, she's living in, quite explicitly, the post-flux-affected universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's... We see, you know, for the first time this season, the Daleks marching on through. She She's currently in what she calls the Dalek Sector. And she then says that the Daleks aren't even the scariest part. They're the, the blue time particles. And we learn later the time particles. She doesn't give them a name. She just says other things are more scary than Daleks. Right. Throughout the entire episode, these these blue, uh, and I guess there are also some like purple or pink ones or whatever, 
these time particle things sort of just engulf people like a, a locust swarm and and leave no trace or something like that. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, I, I don't even really remember. <clears throat> right. Anyway, after that, the doctor, um, she averts the uh, impending demise of Yaz and, and Vinda. Right. She and she, she does this. I don't remember how she does well, it, so we, honestly. We get a little internal monologue, and she quotes John Burroughs. It's basically saying, leap and the net will appear. And we kind of see how she processes situations internally and and time kind of slows down and, and she decides to throw her... Se- so, just a little bit of clarification. At the end of uh, War of the Sontarans, I was under the impression that Swarm had replaced the two broken Mori with Yaz and Vinda. That was evidently not the case because we actually... in. War of the Sontarans, I had forgotten. We actually see Swarm kill two of the Mori, so he's actually replaced the two that he killed with Yaz and Vinda, and now at the beginning of this episode, what happens is the Doctor shoves Dan and replaces the two broken Mori with herself and Dan to basically reduce the amount of strain that Yaz and Vinda will take. And basically her plan is to do that and then figure out from the inside how to get them out of this. Yeah, well, so she gets thrown into the... um What's it called? The the, the, the time, time storm. The time storm. Yeah, and this it's not like the time vortex, but it's it's a storm. So the appearance of the time storm on our watch through this perhaps bears some explanation. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> so my we we watch these on the greatest streaming service of all time, AMC Plus. Yeah, I subbed to AMC (laughs) Plus for this. You're welcome, guys. And my Wi-Fi was having some issues when we watched this. And and it actually, it it was, it was not this episode nor my, like, TV that that was having the issue. When we watched it, I thought maybe it was the TV that was having an issue. I realized later in the night when my computer was also having difficulty on the Wi-Fi that it was, like, actually the internet in the building. So the internet was having a little bit of a time. So we were getting full like 40p specifically during the time storm scenes, probably because like there's so much going on in those scenes that like the bit rate for those scenes just d- died on our TV. So every time the doctor went into the time storm, it looked like she was playing Minecraft. Yeah, it was basically just a pixelated mess, like 2005 YouTube like quality. <clears throat> The, the only time with... it looked all right was near the end of the episode when she was talking with the Mori and begging them to let her go back in one more time. Yeah, combine that with the fact that the time storm looks like the third Doctor's blue intro. <laughs> like, and it was just, it was pretty bad. It was. <laughs> I thought it was great. We saw in this scene, we actually see the Doctor speaking to Vinder... Yaz and Dan and we were like who is she talking like who are those three figures <laughs> uh, it, it should have been obvious at the time what those three figures were we did figure it out you know before the end of the episode we we're like oh yes that's really obvious I don't know why we didn't figure that out but you know at f- yeah, we figured it out like two minutes at later. first it was like what's happening Well, so what the time storm does is it transports them. We learn this a little bit later. But might as well just say it now. Transports them to various periods in their history. The first scene we get of this is the doctor being transported to a period in her past, um, which is the actually the siege of Atropos. But we so when we actually so this is done really well. We don't actually know that they've been flung into their past yet. We know that the time storm is messing with them. And, and at first you think, okay, well, this is, you know, she's been flung to the siege of Atropos, but we don't know, like, we don't know at that moment that it's her past. No. Um, so that's sort of a nice reveal later on when she looks in the mirror and, and sees who she sees. Yeah. <clears throat> The other thing about the time storm is that it replaces um, people in those situations with, <clears throat> I guess, <clears throat> sorry, there's something in my throat. Um, it's that dangling thing that is usually in people's throats. Your uvula. <clears throat> um, I'm just kidding. Yeah, the uvula. 
<laughs> Whatever it's called. That's what it's called. The uvula. Um, what was I going to say? It was so. The other thing we don't know at this point is that like the time storm replaces people in that who were actually in those periods with, I guess, people who get thrown in with you or people from the current era. So, at this point, you know, when you see the doctor and. Yaz and Dan and Vinder, you just think that it's them being thrown into this alternate universe thing. Yeah, but then you and then later you find out that you pretty quickly it's realize not. it's not. Because mm-hmm. they and they don't actually come out and say it, but I'm, we were both pretty sure that Dan in the in the Atropos scenes was Carvanista. We do see him transform into a Lupari and briefly before the Doctor gets flung back forward, but. I, I don't think it's confirmed that that is Carbonista, that Luparian. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. Uh, so would I. We know we know Carbonista worked for the Division, you know. It, it'd it be really weird for them to set that all up and then have this, like, Luparian be a completely different character, you know. Yep. Anyway, Dan gets sent back to, um, I guess, just a period in his past when he was meeting up with Diane. Yeah, poor Dan, for the third episode in a row, gets stuck in Liverpool 2021. Not not poor Dan as in saying that Liverpool is bad. Poor Dan saying that, like, Dan never gets to go to the cool places. He always ends up back in Liverpool 2021. Yeah, true. <clears throat> So he's just kind of, he's basically going on this It's like a wa- date it's, it's, slash walk with Diane. This is, in my opinion, one of the trippiest scenes in the whole episode. Because he's like going for this walk with Diane and he starts at the museum. And every time it seems he's about to recognize something is wrong or every moment he's about to, to process something, it's like he switches locations. Because then all of a sudden they're walking through a garden and then he like he sees something and he's like, oh, what's that over there? And then all of a sudden they're like sitting at the steps of the museum again. Yeah, it's sort of it's it's very dreamlike, right? It's like, you know, you're you know, when you're in a dream and it's like and nothing makes sense and all of a sudden you're somewhere else type thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he he briefly sees the doctor kind of like trying to break through or something, and she's like, just hang on, Dan, like I'll be there soon and and then I think we actually go to... I actually think we get Vinda next, before Yaz. E, I, if we did, I didn't write him down. Let oh, actually, we learn... I think in the in the Dan scenes, we learn that Dan... Um, we learn a little bit more about Dan's backstory. It's not all that important yet. Uh, I guess time will tell if it ever is. Um, but Dan was basically... He was engaged... But then his fiance like broke it off at the last minute. Yeah, I have a note that's like getting Dan's tragic backstory out there. <clears throat> yeah. Uh oh, I guess actually no. Okay, I think we do get Yaz next. We get Yaz back when she's on the beat as a police officer. You know, remember when Yaz was a police officer? Bet you all forgot that was part of her backstory. Yeah, I kind of did forgot she was introduced to the TARDIS because just because like Ryan called the police because he saw an alien thing and Yaz was the one who showed up like imagine how differently this entire era would have gone if just some other police officer had shown up yeah true so she's like in a car and with the doctor and the doctor's like the other officer and Yaz is like wait a minute I know you you're the doctor and the, the, then the other lady flashes back to whoever she actually was and they're like what I'm, I'm realizing that like this explanation that we're giving of the episode makes absolutely no sense if you haven't seen it <laughs> it's really difficult it would be really difficult to explain this in a way that made sense at all we then get Vinda, and so Vinda is he's talking with this superior officer who is currently being portrayed by Yaz, but was not actually Yaz. And he's like, he of of all of them is the one who is like most reluctant to. He he immediately recognizes where he is first off. I guess his is the most like 
impactful moment in his life that he has to relive here. Yeah. And yeah. he is also the one who's like most reluctant to do this. He keeps begging, like, don't make me relive this. Don't make me relive this. Yeah, well, in his first scene, he's actually being, um, like, his. he's done something worthy of commemoration. And they're basically like, you know, you're a hero. You're going to get promoted for this type thing. Yeah, they, they, they have a really funny, like, lampshading of these kind of scenes in this scene, which I really appreciated because, you know, they were like, oh, you did it. You're, like, you're great. And he's like, any other pilot would have done it. And immediately his, his superior is like, that's clearly false because you were the only pilot who actually did it. Everybody else just watched while you did it. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Like, so many movies have a scene where someone goes, well, any other pilot would have done it when, like, clearly there were other pilots who didn't do it right there. So I'm glad they brought that up here. You know, I'm just glad that they put a pin on it. Thanks, Chris Chibi, for doing that, I guess. Okay, really weird thing to hone in on there, but all right. <laughs> it's just something that like really annoys me, you know, in media when like someone's like, oh, like you shouldn't commend me. And they're like obviously being humble, but their method by being humble is like, well, anybody else would have done the same. And then like that, that I don't know, it just really annoys me when they use that line of argument when there's like so obviously other people who didn't do the same. Like, you know, it's, it's like a humble brag type thing or close to it. You know, it's like a, I don't know. I guess he gets he gets promoted, and part of that promotion is being personal assistant to the Grand Serpent, right? The uh, the Mara or whatever yeah. it was called. Yeah, <laughs> no. yeah the snake dance. <laughs> anyway, the Doctor shows back up in the time storm. Time st- was it the time? What it was called the time. St- yeah, it's storm, time storm, right? Yeah, time, it's time storm, storm, but then their time, their t- they were in their time streams. Yeah. Because of the time storm. Yes. Is that? Yes. What's confusing about that? I'm looking on the wiki here. It has time streams. It doesn't have time storm. Oh, no, here it does have time storm. Um, yeah. Okay. So the doctor shows back up in the time storm. The more you're like, hey, you guys are in your time streams. You are reliving periods of your past. Good luck with that. We'll be over here. Have fun. And she's like, <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm just trying to fix everything. And they're like, good luck. It's going to kill you. And she's like, yeah, watch. watch try me. You know, the, the, the more insane things they have the doctor do in this story, the like either, either the more insane thing they're going to have to do to like kill her at the end of her run or the more like hilarious the like trip down the stairs is going to be to kill her, you know, <laughs> like either it's going to be like, oh man, she beat a t- she survived a time storm and like defeated the end of the universe. But ah man, she was like shot by a guy with a bow and arrow or it's going to be like she defeated the end of the universe and then she was defeated by I don't, I don't know the double end of the universe or something I guess yeah yeah I don't know it's just like it's power creep for the heroes you know we always talk about how every villain gets less scary the more they use them because they kind of like feel like they have to make them bigger to make them more dangerous. And it's just interesting to think that the opposite happens for the doctor too. Like the bigger and bigger threats that that the doctor succeeds against either like undercuts, you know, it basically makes it so that you have to have some sort of worthy way of ending their storyline that, you know, that doesn't feel undercut by the fact that, I don't know, they like literally defeated the end of the universe or something just makes it harder to to end their run on a satisfying note in my opinion yeah we'll have to see how they handle it yeah I mean or not by they you mean obviously Chris Chibnall (laughs) yeah so basically what happens next is the doctor is walking through the temple of Atropos because they're they're storming it, and I guess in quotes, there's only four of them. But um, she looks in a mirror and she goes, "Oh my god!" And she what she sees in the mirror is Joe Martin's doctor, right? AKA the fugitive doctor. Yeah. So this this episode actually the credits solidify the name fugitive doctor because I think I think in fugitive of the Jadoon, she's just credited as something like other doctor. Or something like that. 
let me just let me just actually uh, check the credits in future. Yeah, she's just credited as the Doctor. So in this episode, Joe Martin's actually credited as uh, Fugitive Doctor. So this kind of canonizes, I guess, a name that fans have been using for a while. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, interesting, I guess. Yeah. Um, but at this point, yeah, I mean, obviously you've probably like picked up on the fact that this is the Doctor's past because we've seen everybody else and it's been everybody else's past. So it's kind of like a, you kind of figure it out before the episode gets there, which is, you know, kind of fun. Yeah, this episode actually does that a lot. It has that this sort of thing that, you know, a lot of st- stories kind of have this. Um, and I guess it's something that you can actually do very well in sort of a, a time bound a format like a you know a TV series or a movie or something like that where it's you know you're you're linear, linearly watching it uh, in time, um, where it's like two seconds before they reveal something you go oh my god wait is it gonna be and then they they do it you know and then they do it yeah it's it's you know it, it does it really well because you you as the audience member always have the ability to figure it out from what's in the episode you know like. My favorite mystery novels, for an example, in a slightly different genre, is like my favorite mystery novels are the ones where you, as the reader, like are figuring it out maybe a couple pages before the detective gets there, and you can like you can get that that sort of gratification from from figuring out the story. You know, not to say that there aren't mystery novels that don't do that that are good, just that I enjoy the ones where I can figure it out more. Well, well certainly most of them like aspire to what you're talking about. Some don't. Some are just like. Some some just don't, but a lot do. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly there are some that don't, but my point was that this episode does that really well, where like you have all the clues and you're figuring it out like maybe minutes, if not seconds, right before the characters do, and you have that like, oh yeah, like I figured out the mystery gratification. Yeah, in case you either forgot or just didn't get it from what's happening here, the doctor, the Jody Whitaker doctor. Literally, literally, I think has a line here that says, "I'm you in the future." Yeah, which actually is, I believe, also like the first canon confirmation that the Doctor, the Thirteenth Doctor, is ahead of Joe Martin's Doctor. I think that was left ambiguous in Fugitive of the Jadoon and the Timeless Child, if I remember correctly. Although the Timeless Child pretty heavily, pretty heavily implied that that Joe Martin was a was a past form. And not a future you know, form. Well, even this isn't sure. It's just a character saying that, right? Like the doctor could be wrong. She's probably yeah. The doctor not. could be wrong. I guess yeah. It's probably not the case, considering be- everything about this episode. But hey, this is Doctor Who flux. We're in uncharted territory and still, you know, heading into even further deeper uncharted. We're, half- territory. we're halfway through and still making up fan theories on where this is going to go. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyway, she Joe Martin's doctor also appears to have. This is interesting because this mirror kind of acts as a as a gateway for the two to communicate. So she, they are recognizing each other, I should say, and, and they're having a conversation. And, and the doctor is kind of like, so that means that like I was here in the past, and, and the fugitive doctor is like, yep, I guess so. <laughs> well, they continue deeper into the temple of Atropos, and then they meet. Um... They meet Old Swarm and Old Azure. I don't think we ever saw the Old Azure before this, but we did see the Old Swarm um, before he uh, regenerated, so to speak, in in the first episode. Yeah, and I want to say the Old Azure is played by the same actress as the current Azure. So uh, there yeah, isn't a sec- sure. there isn't a second Azure credited in the credits, so I'm inclined to believe that they're the same actress. Whereas, as we mentioned in the Halloween Apocalypse, the two swarms are different actors. Yeah, this is where it becomes a little bit more clear that Dan is Carvanista because I think they like they call him a good boy or something like that, and he's they call him a that, dog. Like, uh, uh, yeah, it says something like "pretty good for a dog," and that's when the doctor goes, "What did you call him? What did you call him? Who are you? Give me your names." And Yaz is like, "Doctor, we're your team," and she, and the doctor is like, just has to accept this because otherwise they're gonna believe it's it's. Uh, hang on, I have it. I have it written here: temporal uh, hazing. And they're going to kick her off the mission, basically. And, and the doctor's like, well, 
the doctor can't let that happen because she needs to she needs to figure out how they defeated Swarm and Azure at Atropos before. Yeah, so later on in the episode they elaborate on this more, but the idea is that they're going to use whatever they did in the past to defeat them in the future. Right. So I think we cut uh yeah, we cut to Dan. Dan has ended up in some tunnels. This is the one scene that is uh, most light. Well, this is the one scene that is not explicitly confirmed to be in a character's future, but probably is. Because... Scene voted most likely to be take place in the future. <laughs> well, because we find out later, you know, in the next Yaz scene, which is coming up pretty shortly, but I might as well mention it now. We actually do find out from the Doctor. She explains that everybody was flung into their time stream, but being flung into their time stream didn't necessarily fling them all into the past of their time stream. It could be anywhere, the past, present, or future. Yeah, imagine if they just got flung into the present you just see present day scenes like them stuck in the temple or whatever. <laughs> Completely useless escape. <laughs> Trying yeah. to escape. By getting flung into the exact moment you were <laughs> escaping from. Well, anyway, he's in these tunnels, and the 1800s guy shows up, speaks in a few more riddles, just, you know, drops a couple more, drops a couple, drops a few more, you know, lines of cryptic dialogue, and then leaves. Yeah, Dan is like, what year is it? And he's like, years? Do you think years matter? And Dan's like, what are we running from? Are we, are we running from those time particles? And the guy's like, those particles? You think those could do damage to us? It's like, what? <laughs> This man answers every question with three questions. <laughs> I mean, I respect it, but damn, man, give us something to work with. I, that's the that's the one character I'm most curious to know. Like, how is this story going to play into this whole thing? How are those tunnels that he's been digging underneath Liverpool a <laughs> hundred and something years ago? Like, how are those going to fit into this universe ending event? maybe they won't maybe this is all just set up for what happens next I don't know this guy is like the guy who kills the doctor in, in her final episode they're just they're setting it up like six episodes early yeah, setting it up a year early <laughs> Well, I mean, if they are doing that, I guess, you know, more power to you, chibi. Anyway, we now return to Belle. Remember her from the beginning of the episode? I didn't in the 20 minutes that it took to get here that felt like 20 hours. <laughs> well, it's completely it completely catches you off guard because it comes up on screen sector coordinates and then like it looked like somebody <laughs> smashed their keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> And and my 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 strongest memory of this exact moment is key ongoing. Can we take a screenshot of that? There's no way I'm going to be able to write that down. <laughs> so she's, I think, currently, currently, she's walking along a planet, and she's like, "I'm trying to get to you, unnamed husband or wife or other." No, she doesn't, she doesn't say who. She just says she's trying to get to someone. Yeah. Yeah. We knew that from her first scene, actually. she sees a big, a big platoon of Cybermen marching. She's like, great, I'm in the cyber sector now. She has like a little pet rock, except it's not a rock, it's a computer with a, di with a yeah, it's face a screen for a face. Dang, I, I thought I had its name written down in my notes, but I don't. Um, yeah, I don't remember what this is called. It, it's like a, um, like a Tomagotchi, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's a little Tomagotchi thing. It's not in the credits, obviously. I don't think it really ever talked. Yeah, they, they didn't. It didn't. So, oh well, I guess. Yeah, whatever. I really thought I had written down its name, but oh well. 
It's just like it's basically She's just her little it, like though. companion, I guess. It's someone for her to talk to. Yeah, it's basically the thing that's keeping her from losing her mind. It's like Box from Star Cops. <laughs> <laughs> Working it in. <laughs> Great, thank you. First, you worked it into inevitable. Now, trust your doctor. What What'll be next? Triple play? Yeah, bring it back just to just so I can reference box. Yeah, bring it back. We haven't even officially announced that it's canceled yet. Guess what? Guess guess what? Dropping that in the, this episode. Sorry, triple play fans. Triple play is canceled. This isn't actually a joke. I know I'm saying it quite facetiously. <laughs> The next season of Triple Play will be its last. Yeah, I thought we actually did already announce that, but whatever. <laughs> nope, not yet. Well, we have now. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Can't wait for all the angry emails that come flooding in. Can't believe you're canceling my favorite decorative vegetable podcast. I'm unsubscribing. I can't wait for all the joyous emails telling us how much better the world will be now that, it's, now that we're... You know, ending it. Mm, I don't like, think that'll happen. Like that happen. meme um, of this. It's this, like, image of, like, a utopian society, and it's, like, what society could be if if blank. What society could be if Triple Play was canceled? <laughs> yeah. What society would be if Triple Play was never started? Mm-hmm. Although, we had the idea for Triple Play before Trust Your Doctor, you know? Yeah, and we those few years that we didn't act on that idea were smart. <laughs> we referenced Triple Play in episode 5 of Trust Your Doctor and then went another year before we ever mentioned it again. But that's, you know, that's some deep Trust Your Doctor lore, you know, on the level of, of the timeless child. Is well, Triple Play the timeless child of decorative vegetable? Well, anyway, I don't know what that means, but well, anyway, <laughs> um, Yaz is starting to realize that things are, are wrong. She yeah. is sitting in an, apart- an apartment. It's her sister's apartment. It's her sister's apartment, but she realizes that it's not an apartment that she recognizes. Which is interesting because to me, you know, you could have told me that this was Yaz's apartment that we saw in all the other stories that had her family and such, and I would have believed it because it looks somewhat similar, I guess, but whatever. Yeah, I also would have believed it. I actually thought for a second it was an apartment in the other stories, but guess uh, it's not. The episode, the episode doesn't, uh, the episode states otherwise. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, they could just be lying through their teeth, and it actually is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they could. <laughs> not that he's not like Doctor Who hasn't lied to us before. So the Doctor shows up and is like, hey, you need to, like, you know, the best place to hide someone is in their own time stream. And I'm currently working on a solution, and I'm getting pretty close. I just need you to survive for a little while longer. And, like, as soon as she says that, like, a weeping angel appears in the video game that she's playing with her sister. And the doctor's like, this actually, you know, the the weeping angel appears because, and the doctor mentions this, that, you know, something weird is going on with Yaz's time stream specifically. Like everybody else, she said, worked out pretty much fine. But Yaz, for some reason, she's having difficulty stabilizing Yaz. And this is when the, the weeping angel shows up. So it's like, okay, well, Obviously, the reason why she can't stabilize Yaz is because this weeping angel is causing issues. Yeah, well, both of those things actually seem, to me at least, to be uh, you know symptoms of something greater rather than. Well, the weeping you know. angel, the weeping angel. We actually knew a weeping angel probably infected Yaz's time stream from the be- from the beginning moments of this episode, actually, because the first time we see them in the time storm, we see a weeping angel and we see it reach out towards Yaz like right before all of them are flung back into their time stream. Yeah, C in quotes you know, with, you know, just sort of look like a Okay, we saw it, it we saw it in 240p <laughs> yeah. but we did see it. I don't remember that actually, but uh, whatever. <laughs> well, it was there. You're just gonna have to trust me on that. 
I guess I could be lying through my teeth, but I wouldn't do that to you, Keon. Huh? Yet. <laughs> Yet. Oh, so yeah, the Doctor and Co. We should mention, because this is going to become irrelevant later, that the Doctor in the Siege of Atropos scene is wearing a darker version of her normal coat. It's like a dark kind of navy blue, I think. Yeah. It's kind of reminiscent of the colors of Joe Martin's Doctor's coat. Yep. And so anyway, the Doctor and her team make it into the kind of main temple area where uh, in the future the Doctor has thrown herself into the time storm. But this is in the past and we see Swarm and Azure sitting on a throne, basically. Yeah, and they explain what the passengers are and that there's more than one of them because at this point we only saw the one. They're basically vessels that contain like millions upon millions of like lives or souls or whatever. Yeah, they're basically mobile prisons. They're like the Matrix, I guess. But mobile. And uh, and and Swarm basically says something like, make sure you're aware of like who's in you before you come in you. Like, watch this. I'm just going to kill millions of people right now. And he like destroys one of the passengers. Right. Good thing we're not still keeping the death count because millions just died. I know. Swarm would have instantly gone to the top of the character kill list, like, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Kills multiple passengers. Yeah, he just really wanted to make his mark on the universe, you know? They allude to what's, you know, the greater conflict that's happening here that we don't fully understand yet. Um, he says, like, time will never succumb to space or something like that. Yeah, the setting up this really interesting distinction between time and space as separate objects or entities. Um, they basically say that, and I guess it's implied that time is like running wild at this point. That there isn't really necessarily like a stable time stream at this moment in time. <laughs> they do say that. There's a line in the episode that that says that. I forget where it is. Um, and yeah, so Swarm is basically saying like. You'll basically never be able to control time, which we all know the Time Lord's folly of trying to control time. Yeah, it's pretty interesting that the Doctor is actually trying to leverage, you know, pretty much that to save the day in this episode, right? She's trying to use the past to inform what to do in the present slash future. Um, so she really is yeah, trying she's... to rely on this sort of her linear experience of time. One. Yeah, it is actually interesting now that you pointed out that she is using a linear experience of time to defeat an entity whose entire goal is to remove the linear instance of time, at least for the time being. For the time being. Oh God. Yeah. Take a shot every time they say time in this episode and every time we say time on our episode. R.I.P. my liver. <laughs> it is also, that is, it does also contrast with what the Fugitive Doctor told the 13th Doctor in The Timeless Child, which is like, when have you ever been fully informed by your past? And I guess the Doctor's answer is, right now, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right this second. <laughs> you know, Doc. Yeah, so they're setting up some pretty interesting parallels between these different characters here. Um, how the what the fugitive doctor um, thinks of how the doctor experiences time versus the thirteenth doctor versus Swarm and Azure. Yeah, I'm really curious to know like if they're gonna really. Obviously, they're tying in some of this timeless children stuff with the fugitive doctor, but I'm curious to know what to what extent they're gonna go in on that you know near the end of flux probably pretty heavily if not at the end of flux then at least by the end of of Whitaker mm -hmm. well we do yeah I mean I guess there's that whole story that we got in the timeless children uh, that one about um, what was his name hang on let me uh what, the Doctor not being from here. Gallifrey? She was actually from that other dimension? No, no, no. The, no, 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 no. Um, 
we get that whole like other we what that that it. final soldier who is like holding out at the end of the world the universe or whatever is that what you're talking about no i'm talking about the like <laughs> Maybe it was an ascension of the Cybermen. The 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 guy in the English village. That's like it's it's a story in the Matrix, and then it's like clearly an allegory for the Doctor's first regeneration about the little boy who gets found in the little English village. What? what? Oh my god! What? <laughs> I don't. Brendan, the story of Brendan from Flight Through Entirety. Do you not remember this? <laughs> <laughs> no, Brendan, the character. <laughs> <I'm> kidding. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't remember this at all. Yeah. What? It's like the whole thing. It, it was actually mostly an ascension of the Cybermen. That Brendan. There was. We got this whole story that like seemed completely unrelated. Actually, like very similar to how Chris Chibnall's doing Flux. We got this whole side plot that seemed completely unrelated oh, to the yeah. plot as a whole. About the boy oh, yeah. who was in the little English village who, like, got found by these two parents mm-hmm. and they, like, adopted him. And he becomes, like, a policeman and then he, like, retires. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember this now, actually. Now and they bring it up. And then there was, like, that whole thing that the master claimed, that whole story that we watched played out, which was actually in The Matrix, was, like, the doctor's life but disguised as a completely innocuous thing and like the evidence that it was part of the doctor's life was that when brendan retired he gets given a clock with a plaque engraved on it that says for you know with thanks for services to the division yeah yeah i do remember that actually what about that why did you why did you bring that up i don't remember anymore <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember anymore. Oh, well. Oh, well. (laughs) Well, anyway. They make a couple more (laughs) honestly hilarious references in this. I I have to mention this. They make a couple more hilarious references to the planet time. (laughs) Further, you know prompting me to think back to the master class level line there's no planet called time i don't know why i've so fixated on that yeah, line I don't, know, but <laughs> I don't know why i don't know why you 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 hang your hat so to speak on that line it was just so it wasn't it's not even that funny honestly it's it's not even bad <laughs> it was just weird <laughs> cuz you didn't expect it came out of nowhere I guess yeah like the flux I, I, well actually that's true I didn't expect flux to be like this whatsoever I didn't expect it to be this good <laughs> contrary to seemingly ex- everyone else I am like really enjoying this I think most of these episodes are that we've seen so far actually all of them are basically perfect I love these three episodes that we've watched so far I do too. I just, honestly, I just love the experience. Yeah. You know, I just, I love the experience of like watching this and it just being insane and, and not knowing what's going to happen next. And yet somehow every episode is incredibly entertaining. Yeah. Honestly, if the, if the three that we have yet to watch suck, it'll still have been worth it just for these three so far. <laughs> so. The doctor reveals the doctor, past doctor, well, the doctor in the body of her former self reveals. And this is really interesting because it's kind of the way the scene is done is that we see both the 13th doctor and Joe Martin's doctor give this ultimatum to Swarm, I guess, in parallel. And it kind of cuts between the two of them. It's really well done. Yeah, and what they're revealing is that. Uh, what was it? One of the Mori was like inserted into one of the passengers or something like that. Yeah, one of the passengers wasn't actually Swarm and Azure's. They like they added one of their own to the group, and they'd hidden some Mori into that <laughs> into the passenger. So a couple things. This is setting up a couple things, but 
One of them is that they're already aware of the Mori and they're already aware that the Mori can control time because Swarm says something like, no, the Mori must never be let onto this planet. So clearly, even at this point, they're already aware or have set up the Mori as, as time controllers. But, you know, the other thing I was just thinking like, man, would have really sucked if like the random passenger that Swarm decided to destroy there like at the beginning was like their passenger with the Mori inside, like, oops, like, oh no, what's the backup plan? Yeah, well, now that I come to think of it, um, this is probably actually what gives Azure and Swarm the idea to enact their plan in the future, right? So they too are actually using their own past to inform their evil future plans. <laughs> Dang, everyone's using the past in the future. <laughs> Fugitive Doctor looking like a real uh, clown at this point. You know, when does the, when does the past ever inform the future? Now. <laughs> well, obviously she meant memories, but... <laughs> But it is it's it's also interestingly setting up I guess a conflict between the 13th doctor and the and the fugitive doctor because the question is like would the doctor have known how to defeat you know I, I don't know so I'm just working through this live I guess I I don't know if it's necessarily in opposition to what the fugitive doctor was saying because if the doctor already knew how to defeat Swarm in Azure, you know, the question is, would she have even thrown herself into the time storm to begin with, which is where she needed to go to actually be able to talk to the Mori so that they could insert themselves into the passenger? I don't know. Like, if she had that knowledge, I don't know if she would have been able to use it. No, it, it's, I mean, I'm joking about it, but it's actually not, you know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, seem to be in conflict with what the Fugitive Doctor says, especially because, you know, Swarm and Azure are the villains, right? And they're actually the ones who are doing exactly what the Fugitive Doctor said. And um, what was her, she didn't say it as formally as, as using the past to inform the future. She says, what did she say? Oh, when have you ever been defined by who you were before? Right? Yeah. Which is exactly what Swarm and Azure are doing, seemingly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, when you say it the way, I guess, the Fugitive Doctor actually said it, it's more like the Doctor is revisiting a memory and using that in her own way to do this because it's not like she threw herself into a time storm in the past to get through all of this, whereas Swarm and Azure are, like, doing exactly what they used to do when they were, you know, Swarm was in his old body. He did, you know, Swarm got a new body. And he did exactly what he did in the old one, which was go to Atropos <laughs> and like try to disrupt the flow of time. He's actually yeah, doing. When you put it that way. <laughs> Damn, Swarm. <laughs> so okay, Swarm seems to have a larger plan in play here. You know, they've they've implied that he's got more going on, but like my point here is that he's doing exactly what what you know, the Doctor was kind of railing against both in Timeless Child and in this, which is like not to define yourself by who you were before. <laughs> right, right. And even interestingly, this that whole thing fits into the Missy... Oh, man, that whole thing fits really perfectly well into, like, the master all of a sudden being evil again in this un incarnation because, like, Missy, like, became good right at the end of her life, but then the next incarnation, like, wasn't defined by, like, what Missy did. Oh, my gosh. Chibnall, you madman. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay, I guess, yeah. Oh, right, I get it. <laughs> see see what I did there? Anyway, don't they actually have a line about that where Swarm, the future Swarm slash present Swarm, is basically is like, yeah, we planned all this, we were using what we did in the past, and now you're here, and we knew this was going to happen I just making that up. I don't well, know. Does, I can't remember at this like, point. Yeah, I knew you were going to release these time particles for me to use. Okay, bye. I'm going to go enact my super secret plan now on another planet, and they vanish. Yeah, that's what happens in a bit. We need to get there first. Yeah, well, they save the day in the past. Old Swarm, Azure, they get booted away. While this is all going on, we've actually, we actually get two scenes with Vinda during all of this. We have completely skipped. 
Yeah, so he's basically, he's serving under the Grand Serpent. And the Grand Serpent is mad at him for something. I don't remember what. It's be- he, like, asks a question. The Grand Serpent, like, flips out. It's a really innocuous line. <laughs> Vinda just says something like, are we sure we should do that? And he goes, what did you say? <laughs> He's like, I want someone who follows orders, not who questions me. And he's like, okay. Yeah, he's, he seems he's not really used to his authority being questioned. The next scene between them, the Grand Serpent orders Vendor to turn off the recording of a, like a business deal um, before he says some sketchy stuff. Yeah, and which Vendor like, does. Uh, do I he complies. Have to? But then later on, he's talking to his superior, who's once again being portrayed by Yaz. Well, and he's like, we have to cut, we have to bring this to light. We should probably mention what the sketchy stuff is, you know. Otherwise, it just seems like Vendo was being a little bit of a dick. No, the sketchy stuff is that the guy is like, okay, so this deal, it's great. But if you want me to sign off on this deal, I need you to do something for me. I'm going to give you a list of nine names. I need you to release four of them because the prisoners, the other five, I need you to kill because they're the family of my opposition, basically. No, oh, yeah, I actually forgot what he what he said there. So yeah, that's what he wants to have done. And that's why Vinda is whistleblowing now because he's like, "Yo, it's not cool that he just like had political that had his fam the family of his political enemy just like murdered so that he can stay the Grand Serpent." Right. As a result of all of this, Vinder gets sentenced to that station that he was on at the beginning. Yeah, and this cut is done really well. Because Vinder, you know, his superior's like, do you really want me to film this? You know, are you sure you want to go through the, with this? And he's like, yes, yes. And he stands up and walks away and the, and the commanding officer goes, sit down, Vinder, I'm not done with you. And he sits down and it cuts to him sitting in the chair on the station. Yep. And he, he, uh, he's recording, he gets one message, you know, one message to be sent out before he begins his exile, I suppose. Into exile I must go, failed I have. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And, he records a message saying, like, I love you and I'll see you soon and I was trying to do the right thing and I'm sorry that it got me thrown on this space station in the middle of nowhere, but hopefully you know, it'll be over before you even know it. And this is another one of those moments where a minute before the episode reveals that you go, wait, is he talking to? <laughs> yeah. And then you find out it's, it's Bell. Yeah, he is confirmed talking to, to Bell because... Another great editing moment. Next scene, we only see the beginning of Vinda's message with the end. Actually, I think cut to Bell watching the hologram recording of the other part of Vinda's message that we didn't see. I think in this moment, she also reveals that she's pregnant. So that's probably going to come into play later. Right. I saw a lot of people on Twitter being like, who's the baby? Is it the doctor? (laughs) Which honestly, I don't think the baby is going to. I think the baby is the least important part, the least important plot element introduced in this episode. It, it's just going to be some some thematic thing. Watch, it's not going. It's yeah, that's all it's going to be. Yeah, because she's in flux. Yeah, maybe. She's she's or it's just going to be like this. Yeah, this like new life type thing at the ending. It'll be the first. Calling it look, right now. The doctor will fix everything. Her baby will be the first baby born after in new universe or something calling it i'm calling that right now that's what it's going to be uh the doctor has fixed everything she has convinced the mori to hide one of themselves in swarm and azure's passenger and they agree they're like yeah we'll do that so they start sending yaz vendor doc and dan back to the present (laughs) forgot dan was in this for a second because he hasn't shown up for a while (laughs) And the doctor begs with the Mori to send her back just for a little longer because she was so close to figuring out something about her past that she didn't know. And they're like, it'll destroy you. And she's like, please. 
please. And they send it to what is possibly the most, how do I want to describe this? The most bizarre scene in the whole episode. Yeah, we don't really know exactly what this is yet. The scene um, was so bizarre, it made Keon and I finish the episode and rewind to watch part of it again. Yeah. Well, the thing I wanted to... The reason why I wanted to watch it again is that I wanted to f- see whether she was wearing the dark coat, which indicated that she was in the you know the, the body of the fugitive doctor, or if she was wearing the light coat, which is, was indicating that she was in the body of the 13th doctor and she was wearing the light one right which to me kind of implies that this might we saw the future of pretty much everybody's time stream except maybe vinda could this be the future of the doctor's time stream instead of the past possibly that's what i'm thinking since this is the body of the 13th doctor yeah i wouldn't be surprised if this has to do with her regeneration because what happens in this scene, she winds up in this like Blake Seven esque room. We don't really even get a very good um, indication of where she is, or uh, you know, we don't really see the background too too well. To me, it was a strong vibe of like a garden of some sort, because the lady who's there is wearing like a gardening hat and is like fiddling with some sort of like water system. And she's she's holding this is Osok like by the way. She's credited as Osok. A-W-S-O-K for all those people at home who want to see if there's an anagram in there somewhere. I know. I was like, well, what is that an anagram for? Is it master? No, I'm just kidding. It's not. Um, but she, and again, we're like kind of playing detective with this scene. She's holding something. You don't, the episode doesn't show you very well what that is, but we paused it and it looks like some sort of light bulb filled with sand or some sort of sandy golden substance. Yeah, I thought it was like some sort of maybe like perfume sprayer, maybe. Looking yeah, object. could be. Flux particles. <laughs> <laughs> and she she has this really interesting scene. She she basically talks to the doctor and she's like, look, you know, the, the flux is a spatial event that that was always destined to happen, but it was created. It wasn't it's not a naturally occurring thing. It's something that somebody created. And then she said Swarm and the Ravagers. So when we got the siege scene earlier, the Doctor and co, the team, basically said they're going in there to get the Ravagers. So this lady, Osok, says that Swarm and the Ravagers are sort of the temporal event that is occurring at the same time as the Flux. That that something is affecting both space and time. Flux being the space part, Swarm and the Ravagers having something to do with affecting time at the same time. Yep. Uh, she says something also about all is ending. I think that's her exact line. I have it written in my notes. And then she, the last thing she says to the Doctor is, oh, don't try and find this place, by the way. Yeah, she just Kaiser Soze's her way out of there. You never you never see her again. No, I'm just kidding. Watch her never show up again. It's just a <laughs> complete loose end. A complete yeah. open book that's just left there. <laughs> I, I I've seen a couple theories on what people think this lady is. Partial to the Rani theory, just because it would be so far out there, they'd be like hilarious she's i saw some people suggest i saw some people Ronnie, suggest I'll do something uh, really embarrassing oh no i don't even know what yet but it, swear to god if, we'll she's start, the Ronnie. if it's the ronnie we'll start cooking with trust your doctor for real this time <laughs> yeah let's just say that i saw some people and i i could semi believe this theory maybe that she could be the white guardian i don't know you know, she's probably not anyone that we've seen before. She's probably, yeah. I mean, the most likely explanation, the explanation I think is most likely true, is that she's someone we've never seen before and is an entirely new character. Maybe she's the Valyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Doctor obviously didn't get the information she needed. And she's flung back into the present, and she's pissed off about it. And she's taking it out on Yaz, as usual. 
Yeah, well... <laughs> Not yet. We, we, we're going to find out that Diane is inside the passenger, and Dan's going to be like, Diane? we got to save Diane. And the doctor's like, well, save Diane, but they're gone. They're not on this planet anymore, Dan. Get in the TARDIS and do as you're told. Right, and we're kind of we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit here. Um, but, yeah, they basically go back. Um, and, yeah, it's basically just what you explained. They find out that Diane is in one of the passengers, and Storm and Azure are like, they have their actual Kaiser Soze moment and they're like, you'll never see us again. And poof, and they're gone. <laughs> I don't know why I'm referencing the usual suspects so much here, but hey. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> Maybe it was all that Ocean's 11 and 12 and 13 talk. Um, Maybe. Director. Um, but yeah, then they have their, they have their work, cut, they have their work cut out for them. They have their next mission, I guess, in, uh, uh, queued up for them which is that they have to go save Diane and I guess find out what caused the flux and stop Storm and Azure from whatever they're trying to do before they get there though they get a little sidetracked first they first the doctor tells Vinda she'll take him anywhere he wants to go and he asks to go to his home planet and she drops him off and he is like everything is bombed out he got destroyed by the flux and he's looking for Bell. And he, he says he'll see him later. The doctor gives him a nice cell phone from the 90s. <laughs> and uh, is like, just push zero. It'll call us whenever you need. So I imagine after next week's episode, next week's episode is probably going to end with a window calling now, I'm going to be honest. And he That's was never prediction. heard from again. Yeah, he was never heard from again. <laughs> Bell never shows up again. We do, yeah, so Vinda is looking for Bell, and then they go into the TARDIS and they get sidetracked from their what's going on with the flux scene from an an- from the angel coming out of uh, Yaz's phone and wreaking havoc inside the TARDIS. Yeah, putting that uh, bit of lore where an image of an angel can become an angel to good use. Right. And preempting the next episode, which is all about the angels. Right. Not the weeping angels, though, actually, surprisingly. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's about actual angels. Yeah. And that's that. That's once upon time. I say if that was just, you know, if it was as if it was nothing, as if we just described the most basic episode in the world. Yeah, that was the most straightforward episode of Doctor Who in in all time. I don't know what you're talking about. We nailed that explanation <laughs> yeah, ten times out of ten. All those classic Who episodes that are stories that were six episodes and really could have been four, those were way more complicated than this. Some of them were in a way because the episode started with the Doctor almost dying, the Doctor proceeding to make no progress towards ending the episode slash serial and then being threatened with death again at the end of the, st- <laughs> the episode. And that's extremely confusing sometimes. It's like, how did you make negative progress in a way towards solving the problem at hand? Wow. Ouch. Yeah, I went there. What are you going to do, Pip and Jane Baker? <laughs> yeah, come at us from beyond the grave. God, it feels so wrong to say somehow. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to be, like, I don't know, haunted or something after this. Provoking the what dead is not a good <laughs> I will say one of the doctor's final lines, it perhaps bears some discussion, which is, or maybe just bears mention at least, that she says, like, yeah, you know, the Mori and I are connected somehow. <laughs> which, does that mean, like, only in the, in the context of the episode, of the doctor put the Mori in place, or in the context of, like, is the doctor and the Mori connected on some deeper level, unknown? Is she, maybe she, do we ever find out what species she actually is in the Timeless Children, or was she just from like another universe? Maybe she is a Mori. Is she Shibogan? Remember? Uh, yeah. 
Wait, I kind of don't remember that actually, but well, I whatever. think actually, I think Tecteun was Shabogan. <laughs> yeah, freaking Tecteun. <laughs> Honestly, looking back, that was kind of an absurd episode. I'm not like mad about it or anything, like some people were, but like, yeah, it was kind of an absurd thing. <clears throat> I mean, all you have to do is remember that the name of Tecteun species was Shabogan and be like, <laughs> yeah, this is ridiculous. But somehow I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Um, I guess just one thing I, I actually did want to talk about, you know, uh, was that I ha had been under the impression before this that the Division was a strictly Time Lord association, you know, strictly Gallifreyan. Evidently, Vinda has not just been dropped off on Gallifrey. Kind of think the Doctor would have made mention of the fact if she was dropping him off on Gallifrey. No, he was he was dropped off on his home planet. I think we mentioned that actually. Yeah, no, no, yeah, we knew he was dropped on his home planet. I'm saying I thought the Division, which I had also assumed Vinda worked for, was a strictly Time Lord association, and evidently Vinda is not well, Time Lord. Yeah, well, also planet. we know Carbonista is pretty much like 99% one of the people who the Fugitive Doctor was working with and he was part of the division, so. Yeah. Um, I also saw somebody point out, and I don't, I have no idea how I didn't make this connection. I'm going to bring it up on the podcast. I don't remember who pointed this out, but we've been talking for like two, three weeks now about how Flux, the word, is, is a pretty apt on-the-nose name from Chris Chibnall, you know? about how things are in change, things are changing, the universe is changing, it's in flux, and how so many things are in flux. And somebody pointed out, like, you know, like, you could take that same kind of idea that, that Chimnall's just naming things incredibly on the nose for things that they are, you know, towards the division, you know? Like, what does that imply about the division? What is it dividing from? <laughs> but perhaps, this is an insane theory, perhaps the division, like, when they put the Mori in place originally, perhaps that created a division of some sort. You know, perhaps the job of the division is to divide this universe from another. You can even go so far as to say, I can't believe if we'd realized this in Timeless Children, this would have been such a great thing to, to drop that the division in that episode might mean like the division between the story we see in the matrix versus what the truth potentially is and how the master thinks they're one and the same, but how there might be a division between them because the doctor in the matrix, you know, Brendan worked for the division. Yeah, that's true. I buy that. But w will Chibnall do something with that? I don't know. We can only, we can only, but wait and see. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting theory. It seems pretty, pretty right, actually. <laughs> <sighs> well, again, we can only but wait and see. That's kind of like the biggest thing I wanted to talk about for this episode. I feel like this episode dropped so many like... So many know, things it's, it's, on us. Just like I said, as soon as we finish watching it, it feels like you just, it feels like, makes you feel like you run, a, I just, I've just run a marathon or something. A couple things, I didn't have anything really to touch on, but a couple things we didn't mention from the episode that I had in my notes that we maybe wanted to mention or something, or at least I did, was uh, we skipped that entire conversation between Belle and the Cyberman, uh, where she talks oh, about yes. how love is not a mission, <laughs> it's an emotion or something along those lines. Yeah, I really thought in that moment she was going to drop a Stephen Moffat Dark Water Death in Heaven reference and be like, love is a promise that you make, you know? <laughs> Throw back to Danny Pink getting assimilated into the Cybermen and Clara's love for him, bringing him back from the brink. Don't remind me. No, literally don't remind me because I forgot about that entire sequence as well. Um, <laughs> How can you forget about Danny Pink? <laughs> Another thing we didn't mention is that as soon, right before um, Swarm and Azure 
just screw off to go wherever do go do whatever they're doing. Uh, Swarm actually gives us a little hint as to what he's doing. Um, I think the doctor asks him, what are you guys going to go do now? He's like, we're going to go rain in hell, doctor. Yeah. Is hell a real place <laughs> in the Doctor Who universe? Genuinely I mean, wouldn't Satan be is real. Like the beast. That's true. Yeah, I forgot about that, actually. The daemons, um, you know, like, similar, similarly to the beast, were also aliens, so they, they're also real, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I know we kept saying we were going to keep track of classic Who connections, but I didn't keep track of them this week either. I didn't really pick up on any that were... Mm, just checking my notes. I didn't pick up nah. on any that were notable. I do try to keep track of these things in my notes, and I, I didn't get any, so... So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get anything, so I just, yeah. Um, you you could make some commentary on the Doctor, like, using the exact same solution the previous time she defeated Swarm and Azure on Atropos to this time. Like, the Doctor implicitly calling out same problem, same solution as, like, sort of being a, a subtle jab at how the Doctor, like, always defeats the Daleks in the same way or something, like, always defeats the Cybermen in the same way. Like, the Cybermen, it's always just, like, you find a piece of gold and you win, basically, like... <laughs> every single episode <laughs> at least that's how it was at the end of the classic show it was like oh the Cybermen are invading it's like oh I have this gold leaf in my wallet it's like oh well never mind I guess mind we won't then. invade then our bad <laughs> um, the angel has the TARDIS is like almost a direct quote from Blink so I mean I guess that yeah it's not to the classic show though yeah it's not to the classic show of course What I one thing I like about Flux is that it's kind of doing, and we mentioned this in our our revisit of Keys of Mariners, and we've mentioned this before that since watching Keys of Mariners, that like one of the most effective ways to do a six episode story or serial is to have the Doctor and the main characters go to a different location in every episode. And so far, that kind of seems to actually be interestingly the mold See, that Flux Dan. is following. Except for Dan, sucks to be him. Unsurprisingly. Yeah, except for Dan. <laughs> and, it, it, you know, it's not surprising that that's the mold is taking because this is modern who in every episode is obviously kind of its own mm-hmm. um, thing. But it's it's interesting and I enjoy that, you know, week one it was like we're in present day Earth basically getting everything set up with some other plot threads. Week two we're in the Crimean War. You know, week three we're again in the present slash future and on Atropos. Week four we're going back to the past with the angels and unknown whether that'll continue for for week five and six yeah switching it up yeah just switching it up a little bit Uh, and i enjoy that you know i'm i'm actually really looking forward to next week's episode because i just can't wait to see what questions get answered what questions will be asked and and what you know what's going to happen in the story specific story Yeah, that's one thing that flux is definitely doing it's making sure to raise more questions than it answers in every episode we'll see if that continues on in the sort of back half of the season that we're now entering yeah i'm expecting maybe next week will be a kind of neutral for asking answering and then week five is going to answer a lot of questions and going to lead us pretty directly into where the story is going to go in the final episode that's kind of my guess. But, you know, the other thing, too, is that we actually don't know... We don't know how many of these plot threads are going to carry over out the realm of Flux into the three specials that mm-hmm. Jodie Whittaker still has going on. Which I guess makes it exciting. We literally don't know. We have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that is that is exciting. <laughs> Extremely exciting. Um, should we uh, do some Britain's 10 actors sure. I mean do we want to talk well do we want to talk about things that are in flux I know you kind of suggested that as a as a as a segment last week yeah I don't know I don't really have any though so whatever 
everything as usual yeah, everything what, yeah exactly what is in flux yeah all right well we'll do some britain's 10 actors all right then. i i only looked up one i think yeah i got two, looked right? up two so i'll go ahead so we have um barbara bar my jesus barbara flynn playing osak she has a pretty extensive career very extensive actually Spanning back to the 70s, she was in Zed Cars, interestingly enough, in one episode. Um, she was in Couples, Keep It in the Family, Second Chance, The Last Song, Britannia Hospital. Um, the, oh, uh, never mind. Was, there was a show that I was going to say, but I don't know how to pronounce the name of it, so forget it. <laughs> um, the Justice Game. Chandler and Co., Wives and Daughters, The Foresight Saga, He Knew He Was Right. Looks like a bunch of British shows here that I've never actually heard of, surprisingly enough. Um, Cranford, uh, Pat and Cabbage, The Durrells, a bunch of other stuff. Death in Paradise, the TV series from 2020, kind of reminiscent title-wise of Death in Heaven, the Doctor Who episode. Great. Everybody's favorite Doctor yeah. Who episode with Danny Pink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I looked up Craig Parkinson, who plays the Grand Serpent. I think he's actually been confirmed to be coming back in episode five of, of Flux. Great. Already. So, Everyone's favorite character, the Grand Serpent. <laughs> with his nice, like, streak of gold, uh, gold, gray hair. <laughs> He's been in a he's been around the block. Seventy eight acting credits to his name. He's doing pretty good. Uh, Intergalactic, the English game, Resistance. He was in Black Mirror Bandersnatch, that like choose your own adventure Black Mirror episode. Uh, Prey, Capital, in Endeavor is a series I I recognize. I'm kind of just picking the series that he had like a long recurring role on. If if I don't recognize anything, uh, Massive. Excuse me. The Inspector Lindley mystery sounds interesting, although I don't know why. Uh, Holby City, the spinoff of... Actually, is that the spinoff or is that the original? I don't remember. The damn British shows anyway. Holby City, The Bill. Uh, and that's you know, that's kind of I've come to the end of his uh, filmography. All right. And I guess we also had... Not a guess. We did. We also had... Uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name, but it looks like Thaddea Graham... Um. Yeah, and maybe British people will be like, "That's not how you pronounce Graham." Well, it's just it's just my accent. Um, she hasn't been in too much. She only has nine acting credits here. She was, I guess, she was also a composer for one thing, so she has a composing credit here as well. She was in the Spartacle Mystery, Danny's Castle, Curfew, the letter from the letter for the King, Us, the Irregulars, Doctor Who. And VHS, those are all her credits. Oh, and hmm. Painkiller, I didn't mention that one. Neat. Yeah. Well, we do have, I guess wrapping up the episode, one email this week from Stephen. Subject, Once Upon Time. Hey, guys, I think you mentioned The Office 1996 at the end of the previous episode as if it's the UK version that led to the popular US sitcom. That Ricky Gervais show started in 2001, whereas the 1996 one is unrelated and seems to be a 30-minute TV pilot written by Stephen Moffat, according to IMDb. As wow. for the episode Once Upon Time, yeah, wow. Brain it was kind of confusing. Sorry, go ahead. But not the type of confusing where I can still get some sort of emotional catharsis because of the metaphors. It felt messy and not very interesting to me. The Weeping Angel no longer felt scary thanks to video game goofiness, and I kept wondering... Sorry, I keep wondering whether anyone remembers that winking is a possible strategy to use against the angels. Not just the Doctor, but people working on the show. Things got mildly interesting when Ruth showed up, and I get that they can't answer everything right away. But halfway through Flux, I find that I don't feel completely on board, and I feel frustrated that I'm not enjoying the season all that much compared to the previous two. Maybe I'm an outlier compared to the rest of the fandom. I don't know. I just have this feeling that I'm not going to enjoy the eventual payoff, whatever it may be. Anyway, I just thought I'd share. Hopefully I find or Oh, I think that should be more to enjoy soon. Cheers, Stephen. But I'm going to read it as hopefully I find ore to enjoy soon. <laughs> yeah. So that I can say, good luck in the mines, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell us if you meet that guy from the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, tell us if you meet that Edwardian unknown man. 
Although, speaking of winking, in this episode, actually at the end of the episode, they took care of that quite nicely by having the lights flicker on and off so they couldn't actually see the angel whether they had their eyes open or not and the angel was moving when the lights were off. So Imagine if they did that. Imagine like if you if the lights were flickering on and off, you just see the angel doing a bunch of like weird stuff. Like it's in a lawn chair at one point. And I don't know. It's like slipping, slipping something out of a bendy straw. Like, you know. <laughs> It's just eating a hot dog. I know. <laughs> just like on a treadmill. <laughs> Frying lifting some eggs. I know, lifting some weights. <laughs> Getting absolutely shredded like <laughs> Shepard Book. Check out Firefly on Inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. At least the angels can also use the killer one-liner, you were looking for salvation, <laughs> because they're angels. Oh, yeah, Although, true. Although angels, as described in the Bible, are freaking terrifying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For all you people, you know, who who think angel, you know, when you think angel, you think of like a typical depiction, like a weeping angel. Let me just tell you that in the Bible, they're described as having like 12 eyes and like <laughs> just all around having like four heads, but just being completely horrific. Yeah, the Weeping Angels, though, are pretty horrific in their own way, I guess. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet's vision depicts them as having four faces, that of a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human. They have straight legs, four wings, and bull hooves for feet that gleam like polished br- brass. One set of wings covers their body, and the other is used for flight. Yeah, so sort of these chimerical beings. And that's just cherubs. We haven't even gotten to the other kinds of angels. <laughs> Well, sorry oh, to hear you're not enjoying fl- Flux as much as you, or as I guess as much as we are, Stephen. Yeah, and that's perfectly fair and understandable, and I actually think most of the fandom is, based on what I've seen, I think most of the fandom is on the side of, yeah, it's aight. <laughs> yeah, once again, I think we're probably the outliers with how much we enjoy the Chibnall Whitaker era. Flux is no exception to that. I'm loving Flex. I'm going to be honest. This is like... I haven't watched a lot of television shows this year. I've watched like, you know, WandaVision, you know, Falcon of the Winter Soldier. Those like streaming television shows. And I got to say, Flex is like definitely top three like TV experiences of 2021 for me. I've said this before more broadly about the Chibnall and Whitaker era and Flex still holds true with it. But it's it's like, it's what I always want Doctor Who to be. (laughs) <laughs> well we were talking about this while we were watching it i was like you know with the appearance of the daleks and the cybermen and the weeping angels and the centaurans and just this entire tying together like to the doctor's ancient history this feels like the finale to doctor who like <laughs> this feels like a big enough story that it is the end mm-hmm. almost yeah it feels like it could just end here doctor who 1963 to 2021 only <laughs> If you don't stop at the end of the Chris Chibnall era, you're not a true fan. Exactly. Well, anyway, I guess if that's it for the emails, we also got some social media comments here. Um, So Keith uh, commented on Twitter, clearing up our Halloween confusion as well. He posted a picture, a, a sort of old picture, and he captured it with me at a Halloween party in England in the 1970s, which explains the curtain. It wasn't big, but it was about mm-hmm. thanks for the podcast, and the curtains look very 70s-ish. <laughs> and it's the... Yeah, I noticed you commented on that tweet, love the curtains or something. Yeah, like yeah, I, I did. So the, the picture depicts uh, just a bunch of kids sort of in, in costume. They look like they're wearing sort of witches' hats and robes, and one of them has a mask on, that kind of thing. So, yep. I put on my robe and wizard hat. (laughs) Do you know that ancient meme? No, no, I don't. Oh, God. Well, thanks for the the tweet, Keith. I'm going to link I put on my robe and wizard hat in the show notes for Keon, I guess. But thanks for reaching out, Keith. And it's it's good to uh, to hear from from someone with personal experience that Halloween has been around in the UK for a little while, at least. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We also had a comment here on Facebook from Boz. This is on uh, our War of the Santarans post slash episode. So Boz says, not too bad an episode, this one, if a bit ridiculous at times, with plot holes you could drive a, a bus through. Enjoyed it. 
Well, you know, <laughs> I don't think I necessarily disagree. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just glad to with the plot holes part anyway. Hear you enjoyed it, boss. I enjoyed it too. Yeah, yeah, it's a good episode. Yeah, we did too. We 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 talked about that uh, quite a bit actually. We both enjoyed it. I think that brings us uh, to the end of our episode on Once Upon Time. Such a great name for the episode, by the way. Just want to throw that out. Right. There. Once again, reminding us that we are on the planet Time, even though there is no no planet called Time. It's it's almost a pun in a way, you know. Well, I mean, it is. It's like it, it's on the it's a pun on the you know once upon a time type thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I just wasn't sure if it like exactly qualified as a pun, but you're the expert on puns, so if you say it's a pun, I'm just going to agree. Not really, but whatever. I guess I'll just take that moniker. Of the up. two of us, yeah, of the two of us, you are. I am. All right, sure. Why the hell not? What are you going to say that I'm the expert on puns between the two of us? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Fo- just voice Great. that on anyone but me. Great. Well, you can reach us at the Doctor Decade of Vegetable Doctor. Questions, comments, concerns, angry ants, love letters, your discussion on who between the two of us is the king of puns. You can find us on YouTube at Decade of Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and anywhere you find the podcast at Trust Your Doctor or Doctor Who Podcast. Be sure to leave any if you liked the so show. Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Also like us on Facebook. Check us on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. Next time, we're going to be continuing Flux with Village of the Angels, but until then, the end.